uh, dedicated to uh, the activism of women communists, although it's not the only one which we'll be dealing with this topic, as we will see later on, but this is the one which is purely uh, focusing on the Communist Party of Yugoslavia and uh, the activity of women there. Uh, our first uh, panelist is uh, Anna Rajkovic, uh, who works at the Institute of Croatian History, the Department for the History of Slo uh, Slavonia, Srijem and Baranja, based in Slavonsky Brod. Uh, she just recently got her uh, PhD uh, in December last year, and her topic was uh, the ideological conflicts in the workers' movement of Osijek for, from 1918 until 1939. Uh, she is uh, also the author of a recently published book called uh, The Women's Long March, uh, The Position of Working Women and the Women's Activism in Croatia uh, Between the Two World Wars. If you buy uh, today's issue of Novosti, you can actually read an interview uh, with Anna uh, there. Uh, she has also uh, authored uh, many articles in academic journals, both in Croatia uh, and abroad. And today she will be uh, uh, presenting her work titled The Activism of Communist Women in Interwar Yugoslavia. Hey, Stefan, am, am I starting right now or? Uh, yeah, you can start. See where... Okay, I've got presentation, so I will have to share screen first. Okay. Can you see it? Yeah, we can see it. It's good. Okay. Wait just a second. Okay. Um, hello to everybody. As Stefan told you, I would say something about the women activism in the framework of Communist Party in the interwar Yugoslavia. Uh, most of this was um, due to my research for the book which Stefan mentioned uh, earlier uh, for introduction. Sorry. Okay. Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, first I will say something about the social political context in the, in the sense of formation of communist party and so on, very uh, brief. Then I would say something about the position of the women uh, not only in, in, in Yugoslavia, but a uh, little broader. And then of course, this, uh, the forms of activism in which were Yugoslavian uh, women involved, who are they, uh, why uh, they are becoming act activists and, and uh, so on. For introduction, as we all know, during the World War I, some gender roles had been redefined because women now starting, I would say, uh, to work men's job. They are going out of the house, they are going to the factories, on the field, and so on. And this was directly connected with the rise of women activism in the sense that women felt that now is their time, I would say. Uh, there was born a uh, new, new hope in a women's movement. This was cor uh, corresponding with foundations of communist parties, which were uh, which had embraced, I, I would say, this new women, how it called by the Alexander Kolotnai. So far, for uh, for the first time, we have ordinary women workers who had become more engaged in what was going on society than in the period before. Uh, due to war experience, uh, women believed that now is the time as I have uh, said it earlier, to finally get the voting right. This was the main issue. So we can say that this was all desire and a new hope, but the new hope was crushed, especially in, in Yugoslavia, because uh, in the new constitution, there was really nothing about this question because only it was stated in one paragraph that uh, women's rights to vote would, uh, would be dealt in some form of the future law. Of course, uh, that never happened. So women waited, waited, waiting all this interwar period. Uh, even so, uh, women starting to fight 
and the women started to fight in the sense for better position, not only in, in the family, but also on, on, uh, on their workplace, on uh, uh, society in general, and so on. They, um, how they do that? They started to get involved in political activism, uh, protest assemblies, and so on. Most of them, or one part of them, joined the Communist Party and trade unions. Uh, here is some fact that is not uh, most common, but uh, uh, that uh, after the World War II in 1920, who else than Clara Zetkin organized CWM, uh, Communist Mo uh, uh, Women's Movement. And in uh, this sense, on its first Congress, Clara said that there is a increasing mass of women who are joining the Communist Party and the party's structures needs to take advantage of, of it because if you have a women, then you have got a mess. And this was a very important issue in, in, in the sense of Communist Party. Uh, and now we are going back to Yugoslavia uh, because after the World War I, uh, how I spoke it earlier, there was a um, uh, Communist Party was organized all over the Europe. Uh, then we have uh, got in, in Bulgaria, in Germany, in French, and so on. And uh, in this sense, uh, 1990 in Yugoslavia, there is a Congress of Unification, uh, which took part in, in uh, Belgrade. And uh, in this Congress was a few women, not a lot, but a few, uh, such as Maria Semani, Maria Jukic, and Adela Pavosevic. Uh, this Congress also, all, also established a central secretary of socialist women, uh, which was a part of the new Communist Party. But uh, this body uh, wasn't on its own. It was kind of um, part of the Communist Party, later known in Vukovar. Uh, in the terms of uh, gender, this Congress of Unification was very clear in pointing out rights to uh, uh, equal, equal rights, no matter of sex or uh, gender. Uh, so in this sense, uh, I would uh, uh, say that it is very important uh, to say something about the workers' newspaper, which were published in Vukovar in 1990, uh, where it published an article about marriage in which was stated that uh, uh, women would no longer be defined by marriage, which is very important, and also stated that marriage would not be economic solution for women in the future communist society. Uh, marriage as economic solution was very often in the 19th century, also during the war and so on. So this was a very progressive opinion in 1990, but this communist uh, society never took place. So this idea kind of uh, disappeared in, in interwar Yugoslavia. When we are talking about the communist organization, of the women, then I would say that we uh, have four main organizations. Here are on the PowerPoints, uh, youth section of, of the Women's Movement Commission for Work with Women and, and so on. In all this organization, uh, uh, women were very, very active. Also, I would like uh, to say that we, can, uh, we can't talk about the massive organization because uh, Communist Party was illegal. But in the sense of, or, of, of organizing women and so on, we can talk about some sort of, of, or, uh, of organization. Uh, during my research, I have a group of three profiles, I would say, of uh, women which were uh, who were involved in this organization. They are female workers, of course. Then we, uh, then we have students and housewives. Here are some of their uh, names, Maria Zumbe, Štefi Samarkic, Marija Jasukic, and so on. Uh, uh, most of them are unknown to us, besides uh, Tatiana Marinic, Ananka, Butorac, Zlata Miller, so on, so on. Uh, but most of these women are unknown. I will talk to, uh, about that something later. Uh, when we are talking about the progressive women in Yugoslavia, I would like to, to quote uh, uh, Renata Jandršić Kirin, who wrote one of her books, uh, saying that progressive young women in Balkans had been given the police record long before they got the right to vote. I would uh, fully uh, agree with this 
statement. Uh, as we all know, police was very strict when we are talking about the, the communist propaganda, communist ac activities, and, and so on. This was all very, very illegal. Uh, so uh, in the sense of the police tracking the communists, they are tracking the communist women also, uh, such as Maria Junda, Štefica Maretic. And uh, as you can see, the, uh, the police uh, record was, was very, very, uh, I would say, uh, good and uh, vivid with the description of these women. So you have got for Stefi Samaritic that she had a thin neck, poorly developed. Some of uh, as Eva Nusker, she uh, she has a nose wavy. I I saw her piece, uh, picture. You have it here. Uh, it means that her nose is big and it has a little crunch on it. So uh, police was very very thorough in this sense. Uh, when we are talking about the forms of, of activities, then I have grouped it in four group. As you can see, uh, there, uh, the women mostly were uh, involved in, in couriers activities, agitators. They were also very involved in strikes, in distribution of illegal material, and they were very involved in, in socialist youth, so, uh, which was named as, as we all know. Uh, I think it is very important to say that most of the women are still unknown, such as Ivan Kamoacevic, Maria Sertic, Anna Weiss, and so on. But these women are very, very important uh, in the sense of um, spreading communist idea. Because as you can see, they, uh, they were carrying illegal materials, they were founded even in, um, in the name, in the uh, sense of Maria Sertic, she gave a lot, a lot of money for printing Serp and Czechic. She was later arrested. I think uh, she was uh, murdered in 1927, I think. Uh, then we've got Anna Weiss who rewrote these communist pamphlets, flyers, and so on with her hands. So this was a great uh, deal of uh, job. And we can see here how the women were so convinced in this idea of uh, communism, communism as society and, and so on. Uh, also, a lot of uh, these activists were in, involved in strikes, especially in the framework of the United uh, Working Union of Yugoslavia. Uh, and, in, and independent workers uh, who are the most powerful, I would say, organization in the union sense. Reason for these strikes were different from low wages to strikes of solidarity and so on. Uh, in this sense, our, our organization Radnik published an article in, 1970, uh, in 1927 with the name Female Workers Are Waking Up, uh, in which it has been stated that women are the, larger, uh, the largest exploited group, and now it's the time for female workers to rise and to say something about their own position. So not uh, that the male workers are talking about it, but the, uh, the, the, the female duty kind of is to step out and say, and say something, it's enough for, uh, it's enough, uh, for us to work, I don't know, 10, 12 uh, hours a, a day, we have got poorly working conditions and so on. And women did, especially in the 30s. Um, also here, I would like uh, to uh, say that when we are talking about the labor organization union and, and so on, we, uh, we, uh, women oft, uh, often use this, organization, union to talk about something else, not only um, in economic sense. So I have found uh, several articles in uh, which was uh, stated that inside the, the union organization, women are also talked about uh, education, about the abortion, also about prostitution and so on. So uh, kind of labor union gave a broader context for, for women to be uh, to be active in this uh, in this uh, sense. Uh, another very important form or, of uh, activity was the distribution of illegal material. Here I have kind of uh, uh, chosen here uh, three examples 
Obrosa Gomboš, uh, Ana Vlaške and Maria Kartali Knežević. As you can see, Rosa and Ana were housewives, so they were uh, doing this illegal uh, work while having a family back at home, and they were uh, putting a lot of risk, not only uh, their own lives, but all, all, also the lives of their children and so on. And uh, especially Anna Vlaški, who was a, a distributed surplus and, and Czechic all over the Slavonia, from, from Vukovar to Slavonsk Kibrod, she was very, very, very active. Uh, and the women who were, uh, who was working, like Maria Kartali, very often were fired from the job because of this um, uh, activity. So Maria got fired, I think, back in the 30s, uh, where she was working in Vinkovci uh, in, the, in the brickyard. Uh, and uh, one of the least, but not uh, the most, uh, uh, less uh, uh, organization in which we, in which uh, uh, women took place was Youth Communist League, Skoevke. Uh, here is very, uh, very also very interesting example of uh, Ružica Reitner. Ružica Reitner was born in, in Osijek and she lived in Osijek in, 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 in this period. Uh, and I have uh, uh, found in police record that it was written she is a communist. Dot com, and then later on she is um, a Jew, and then she is a red Jew. So in here we have got kind of discourse in which was incorporated anti-communism and anti-Semitism, which was very often the case. I have found several of uh, of these of these examples in archive here is uh, in Osijek. Um, I would like to al also state uh, say that there is a lot of other forms of uh, activities such as uh, activity in the Red uh, uh, Red Star. Later, that organization changed name in Red Aid, in which women were providing um, assistance to arrested communists and their families, and so on. Uh, why why communist uh, activism is important in general question? Well, uh, it is important because uh, these activities contribute to social visibility of the women, uh, but they're considered to be se second, as Simon uh, stated, because they were having no uh, voting right, there was restriction on abortion, there were, uh, they didn't have all owner rights and so on. It also contributed to raise uh, awareness of women's question and their need for active political role in the terms of changing the political system. So this is very Im important because through the, uh, their activity, they were not only uh, trying to uh, to change the position of the women, but also the position of state, I would say. So they 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 were very very different in that sense from the, some other society, such as Jenski Pokret and and so on. And to conclude, uh, I would say that Communist Party of Yugoslavia encouraged a greater female involvement through the union, uh, through the. Uh, uh, through the, the United Worker Union of Yugoslavia and independent workers. And uh, as I have stated earlier, there were uh, different forms of activities such as agitation, striking, distribution, subversive materials, and so on. So when we are talking about the activism of the women in the communist sense, I would say it is very important uh, to research this, uh, this area because when we are talking about communist women, then the, the narrative stops kind of at the Tatiana Marinic and Anka Butorac. But there, as I have uh, pointed out, there is, another, uh, there is a number of other women who were very involved, but they were kind of put aside. So we've got Tatiana, Anka, that's it. But I think there is much, much more to it than the, uh, these two women. So this is it. Thank, uh, thank you very much, uh, Anna. Uh, before we move on to the next panel, I would just like to point out uh, 
in, in case you have some colleagues or friend or friends or anybody interested in fo following this live, uh, we have moved on to a new uh, link on YouTube because the live stream link uh, seems to expire once you uh, pause it. So I have now sent it to the chat in case anybody you know is having difficulties finding us uh, and finding the second panel, you can send them this link. Um, now we're going to move uh, on to our second uh, panelist, uh, that's uh, Ivan Simic. Uh, Ivan is currently the principal investigator on the project uh, Communist Gender Policies Towards Muslim Minorities uh, at Charles University in Prague. Uh, he has previously received his PhD at the University College London and has done a variety of quite impressive postdocs at, in Ottawa, Sofia, in Graz, and also at Yale University. And uh, he is the author of the book, uh, Soviet Influences on Post-War Yugoslav Gender Policies, which was published by Palgrave Macmillan in 2018. And today, Ivan is going to be presenting a paper titled, The Only Road to a Full Liberation of Women, Yugoslav Communist Women and Their Soviet Mentors. Thank you. Uh, sound check first. Good, I will try Thank to you. share the presentation. Uh, should be this one. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, excellent. Uh, good. So, uh, as Stefan said, this is a part of a much larger project that explores communist gender policies towards Muslim minorities in Eastern Europe. Um, the idea of that project is to show similarities uh, between different communist projects and interventions into Muslim communities and to show differences and to try to explain them. Um, I want to show how communists in Yugoslavia and Bulgaria adopted Soviet models and used them for their own state-building state purposes. As each case went a step further from the Soviet Union, it shows how local Yugoslav and Bulgarian elites interpreted what they considered to be a proper Marxist approach and how they adopted that to their political goals. So what I will present today is just a tiny, tiny fraction of that project. And I will talk about the core and the basis for Yugoslav gender policies. And this research is, I have to say, possible thanks to my postdocs, doctoral students and research assistants. So kudos to them. Um, I argue that Yugoslav and Bulgarian communists learn how to approach gender related issues during their stays and education in Moscow during the 1930s and 1940s for Bulgarians particularly and thanks to the vague ideas and translations from the Soviet publications. Many of these communists studied at Lenin's International School in Moscow, which at some periods was led by notable Bulgarian communists. Besides official texts in the school curriculum, Yugoslav and Bulgarian communists were regularly reading Soviet Pravda and other Soviet newspapers. I also argued that during this period, the most notable Bulgarian and Yugoslav communists were Stalinized, while similarities between the Yugoslav and Bulgarian communist parties are often overlooked and there were many similarities. While exploring these cases, my approach is informed by recent trends in transnational gender history. Uh, as I'm looking at how the Soviet ideas informed Yugoslav and Bulgarian cases, it is particularly important to see the transfer of ideology, institutions, or policies from the center to the periphery. As transnational history usually tackles specific movements, transits, and circulations that crossed or transcended one or more national borders, it can focus on interconnections and dynamic processes, but it also recognizes the power of some entities over others. I think that interconnection is a central analytic in research on sexuality, gender roles, and gender policies. As Dagmar Herzog described it, the transnational history approach is of particular value because it considers a combination of factors that determine changes in sexual cultures. In this case, that means moving beyond Yugoslav or Bulgarian borders to uncover background and models for the gender policies. The examination of the transfer of Soviet models starts with the interwar period when the main agents of transfer were influenced by the dominant ideas of the Soviet Union. The Communist Party of Yugoslavia was made illegal from 1921 onwards and operated underground during the next 20 years in which Yugoslav communists became even more dependent on the Soviet aid and advice. Being trained in Moscow or simply being known as communists brought significant danger in interwar Yugoslavia. The majority of communists were interrogated, tortured, and imprisoned numerous times by the police. Many women were also brutally tortured so as to disclose the names of other party members. For example, one of the leading communist women of that time, Anka Buteraz, we, uh, we just heard about her, barely survived days of beatings and interrogations before the party managed to send her to the Soviet Union. Spasenia Babovic was also arrested numerous times before escaping to Moscow. 
Vance Dare, Babovich, and many other communists passed the training and international Lenin school. It consisted of learning of Marxist classics, Stalin's and Stalinist texts, but also of a practicum at the end of the course. Lessons were based on the Soviet experience and students were taught the party work and how to work with the masses from the Soviet examples, regardless if it was applicable to the native countries. As Julia Kustenberger argues, it was a constant process of Stalinization. Students learned to apply in practice and themselves the principles of socialist competition, criticism, self-criticism and conspiration. Kirchenbaum writes that the idea uh, was to make international communists reliable, unsentimental, and uncompromising. They were disciplined to become proper Bolsheviks. Babovich is an excellent example of that process, as during her entire career, she was a fierce Stalinist in her work methods. She placed the party first, uncompromising and following the party line. She was a fierce anti-feminist and ready to crush any opposition. Back home, the party was also engulfed in a conspira in conspirational atmosphere. In the communist underground press, the interwar Yugoslav state, with its institutions, legislation, and practices, became the main enemy against which the communist identity and policies were defined. The party saw solutions that were different, disseminating highly idolized images of the Soviet Union in their own press, presenting it as a state in which women were equal, workers were liberated, and people lived happy lives. The lack of domestic intellectual debate on gender issues among the communists contributed to reliance on the Soviet ideas. The first generation of Yugoslav communists, including the leaders such as Sima Markovic and Filip Filipovic, barely discussed gender relations, patriarchy, or the position of women. However, many Yugoslav communists of this older generation did not survive Stalin's purges, those perishing, including the leadership of the party. Hundreds of other Yugoslav communists disappeared even before the war started. A new generation of communists was very young. For example, among communist women in 1936, Mitra Mitrovic was only 24 years old, Anda Novosel was 21, Milka Minic was 21, Harta, Hes, Harta Haas was 22, Vida Tomšić was 23, etc. Many in the party were not much older either. If the first generation was Bolshevized during the 1920s in terms of organizational practices, this generation was Stalinized. As Brigitte Stöder has pointed out, that Stalinization was reflected through a system of rules, codes, conventions, and cognitive structures which combined taught one to speak and see Stalinist version of Bolshevik. Similar to other international revolutionaries, Yugoslav communists were disciplined and used as key instruments in promoting Stalinist policies. Many of them will survive the war and be the crucial agents in applying this politics on Soviet terms, and that is the main point. They followed the Comintern stance regarding feminism and feminist societies before the Seventh Congress of the Comintern, trying to, distort, trying to destroy feminist societies. Then they followed Dimitrov's directive after the Seventh Congress, trying to infiltrate the feminist societies. And that was not just the case for Yugoslav communists, but for all others in Bulgaria as well. Yugoslav Communist Party must never be looked in an isolation. Before the Seventh Congress of the Comintern, Yugoslav communists were following the line set at the 1928 Congress in Dresden, when they discussed the women's question. They condemned, quote, bourgeois exploitation of the female workforce, end of quote, and demanded the end of women's, quote, political disempowerment, legal inequality, national suppression, and remnants of feudalism, end of quote. The party decided to form a committee that would focus on work amongst the women and win them over against feminist and clerical societies. The line was fiercely anti-feminist. When Mitrov ordered the change of line in 1935, young communists youthfully followed the comment and directive tunneled through the party. The United Front politics became the line and many young communists entered youth and women's societies. It didn't mean that Yugoslav communists were any less anti-feminists. For example, they were particularly active in the youth section of the women's movement, Jenski Pokret. Often getting in conflict with older feminists during the discussions and readings of Marxist classics, which feminists tried to prevent. The conflicts were growing to the extent that the Zagreb section of the women's section decided to abolish the youth section in, in November 1937. Nevertheless, through these and other young communist women's activities, the party also managed to publish the magazine Jena Danas, which became the party's women's section official magazine a few years later. The first detailed party statement on gender policies, whose core would remain unchanged over the next few decades, was made in 1940 at the party's conference in Zagreb. Vida Tomšić and Spasenia Balpovic were the first women admitted to the Central Committee, while Tomšić presented the gender program. She condemned liberal feminism, claiming that feminism separates women from the working class and turns women against men, rather against the ruling system. Instead, the political struggle for women's 
left, right, had to be part of the worker struggle for the new people's government of workers and peasants. The Soviet Union was declared the sole model for organizing future society. As Tomšić explained, in the Soviet Union, women were fully equal to men, had equal salaries, could enroll in any school, and become whatever they wanted, but they had an equal role as men in public life. She emphasized the maternal care that the Soviet Union provided, claiming that the Soviet Union was the only country in the world where it was joyful to be a mother and urged Yugoslavs to demand the same rights. Once the Second World War started, many of the most committed Yugoslav communists had clear ideas concerning desirable gender roles and gender policies for which the Soviet Union was the prime model. The pre-war communist women led the charge and modeled their own women's section, the AFG, based on the Soviet genital. Since the beginning, the organization was suspicious of feminist deviation, and there were talks about its dissolution already in 1943. Nevertheless, it was kept to the party's needs to provide support and explain the genital's existence in post-revolutionary Russia. The AFG mobilized a significant number of women, but the ideological risk was always hanging over its head. After the war, it was relegated to social issues, and we can talk more about that, but once it was abolished, Gilas used precisely the exact words as Kaganovich 14 years earlier when he abolished Genodel. Anyway, considering how the Yugoslav press wrote about the Soviet Union and what they talked in closed meetings, there is no evidence of any ideological disparity between Yugoslav communist women and their Soviet counterparts. As Yugoslav communist press eagerly translated Soviet newspapers and published them in their magazines, Stalinist policies became the official ones. For example, Stalinist pro-natalist policies had already found its way into the partisan press during the war. In an attempt to challenge rumors that Bolshevism destroyed traditional family structures, the party press insisted that the family is the backbone of the Soviet Union, a country where parents love their children more than anything. Borba also reported that the Soviet Union had introduced an honorary title of mother heroine and medals such as the Order of Maternal Glory and the Maternity Medal just a few days after these were announced in the Soviet Pravda. The Yugoslav articles proudly emphasized that in the Soviet Union, care for mothers of children and the strengthening of family were always one of the most important tasks. The Yugoslav version of the article was entitled, quote, let's glorify the woman mother, and adding that being a mother is the biggest source of joy one can come to achieve, and that, quote, a woman who did not discover the happiness of motherhood did not, understood, did not understand the importance of her duty, the duty to have children who will continue to build a socialist life who will be the bearers of new ideas and morality, end of quote. After the war, many Yugoslav women politicians intended to nourish close relationship with the most notable Soviet women, hoping that their experience would help Yugoslav communists train their own gender policies in practice. Stalinized Yugoslav communists wanted Soviet women to be their mentors, being in regular touch with Nina Popova, for example. Soviet women were the most honored guests at the first post-war Congress of the party's women's section. Many speeches were interrupted by the audience with their loud chanting to Tito, the army, Stalin, the Soviet Union, and the Soviet women. When the Soviet delegation finally entered the hall, the speech of a Czechoslovakian delegate was interrupted and quickly forgotten. The Soviet delegates were immediately brought to the stage, promising closer cooperation and help. The Yugoslavs then showered the Soviet delegation with gifts, but some meetings became very emotional. For example, one disabled woman, wounded in the war, offered hugs and love as gifts, as she possessed nothing else. What was that? Okay. Anyway, peasants from remote areas of the country said they had only come to the Congress to see Tito and the Soviet women. Actually, during this Congress, many Yugoslav women saw Soviet women for the first time. The leading officials, Vida Tomšić, Spasenia Babovic, Mitra Mitrovic, and others, defined how Soviet models were going to fit in with Yugoslav practice. Vida Tomšić reminded the audience that the Soviet woman was, quote, a great role model, end of quote, during the war, and the model they should follow during peacetime. More precisely, Soviet women supposedly played an essential role in the reconstruction of the destroyed country and so should Yugoslavs. While as regards legal changes, Yugoslavs should implement Soviet policies for childcare and protection of mothers and female workers. Her speech confirmed the program she set out at the party conference before the war. The difference was now that she had Soviet women able to give advice and share their experience on practically implementing these ideas. These speeches at the Congress were published together with a brochure about Soviet women adequately entitled Soviet women, our sister, and a role model. When the Yugoslav Soviet conflict erupted over Yugoslav foreign policy in 1948 and other reasons, it caused disbelief, disillusionment, and fear amongst many communist women. 
The leading communist women, however, did not alter their gender policy, despite being very disappointed with their Soviet sisters, who followed official state policy towards Yugoslavia, condemning Tito's regime and isolating Yugoslav women on all occasions. The high expectations that leading Yugoslav communist women had of Soviet women constituted one of the main reasons for the bitterness. A second reason was the isolation from the international communist community that the Soviet Union had imposed on them. The AFG was expelled from the WIDF and had the daunting task of explaining to its membership that the Soviet Union and WIDF had abandoned socialism and any sense of fairness. The sense of betrayal was overwhelming after years of looking at Soviet women as their prime role models. Even many years later, in 1955, when AFG no longer existed, and when the process of political reconciliation between Tito and Khrushchev began, leading communist women were still resentful as concerned the previous disputes. For example, Bosa Cvetic, at that time the president of the Alliance of Women Societies, was invited to Moscow, where she was warmly greeted by Nina Popova and showered with gifts, hugs, and kisses. Nevertheless, she remained cold-hearted. Bosa Cvetic received the best seats at the meetings, and although Soviets supposedly admitted having made mistakes over Yugoslavia, she was very critical of what she saw there. At their internal meeting, Bosa Cvetic warned Yugoslavs traveling to the East to be careful, demonstrating how Yugoslav communists had become emancipated from the Soviet tutorship by 1955. Decades of adoration slowly disappeared, although the consequences of the Soviet mentorship were visible for many years later. After de decades of looking towards the Soviet Union as a socialist paradise that provided the model for every sphere of society, Yugoslav leadership had to find their own way. I argue that making such a leap was achieved more quickly in politics and the economy, rather than changing the fundamental principles upon which society was organized. Stalinism was the only way to knew. The party cutters learned to think about gender issues and transforming society in one specific way. It was not, not until the 1970s that there was a new wave of feminism, while a new generation of feminism was able to detach itself from many basic principles acquired in this earlier period. Spasenia Babovic and Vida Tomsi generation could not relate to this feminist movement and its ideas, particularly if that meant some level of detachment from state socialism. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivane. And now we'll move to our uh, final panelist, uh, Minja Bujakovic. Uh, Minya uh, obtained her BA uh, degree at the University of Belgrade and then also got an MA degree there, uh, following, uh, followed by another MA degree at the Central European University in Budapest. Uh, she will be starting her PhD at the European University Institute in Florence in the fall. And she uh, researches the history of the communist uh, women's activism in the interwar kingdom of Yugoslavia as well as the history of transnational feminist encounters in the interwar period. And uh, today, uh, Minyas will present a paper titled Nuances and Performances of Red, Communist Women's Activism in the Interwar Kingdom of Yugoslavia. Thank you, and thank you, Anna and Ivan, because that was a great introduction to my presentation. So today I will present a part of my current research that focuses on communist women's activism in the interwar Yugoslavia. And I will focus on period between 1929 and 1934 uh, through the analysis of memoirs of communist women. And I believe that memoirs of communist women are useful in reconstructing the history of the, uh, the inside of history, meaning the history of thoughts and agency of uh, individual uh, historical agents. But before I go to the results of my research, I will quickly introduce the sources that I use. Uh, so memoir, memoirs I rely on uh, are stored in the historical archives of Belgrade, and they are based on the interviews conducted between 1958 and 1960. Um, still, uh, all these memoirs pertain to activism of communist women in Belgrade, uh, so I focus on this part of Yugoslavia in my research. And um, as I mentioned, I will address the period between 1929 and 1934, uh, because relying on uh, communist party documents when exploring communist women's activism in this period uh, would lead us uh, to believe that um, communist women's activism in this period was in a state of hibernation. However, analysis of communist women's memoirs paints a different picture and demonstrates that uh, women in this period, communist and communist inclined women in this period, uh, simply performed the range of activities on the ground and this shift of perspective from bottom up to top uh, from 
top down to bottom up uh, actually allows a different interpretation uh, of communist women's activism and shows that they were not just passive recipients of the directives stemming from the party, but that they were also individual agents and that uh, the history of the communist party simply cannot be explored outside of the grassroots movement it emerged from. Um, before I go to the analysis, few remarks are in place. Uh, so to start with, all women that I um, mentioned in my research were born in the early 1910s. Uh, so they were uh, in their early 20s when they joined the workers' movement. And uh, also they were mainly single. Uh, most of them pertained to the uh, unskilled or semi-skilled workers, and only few had high education. And uh, also another common denominator for all of them was that they came from different parts of Yugoslavia um, and then came to Belgrade around 1931-1933 and then became active in the workers' movement. So this was, exam uh, for example, the case uh, with Le Paperovic, who came to Belgrade in 1932 and learned about the the Communist Party through her acquaintance with uh, Anja Rankovic. And when describing her aspirations to join the movement, Lep stated, quote, during my last years of schooling, I realized that uh, I am a communist by conviction, that I want to work and that I need to look for a possibility to become connected to the party. And I believe that uh, Lepe's statement is quite instructive for exploring the history of the um, organization of the party as it illus illustrates that becoming a party member was not uh, just a simple task and that it did not de depend only on the will of an individual, but also on the connections within the party. And then, um, then the relationship between the connection and the potential member uh, and as many cases from communist women's memoirs show uh, uh, memoirs demonstrate uh, communist women were first acquainted with the activity of the communist party through their family members or close friends or partners and then they would express sympathy for the movement uh, after which they would be given a range of activities to perform on the ground and only two or three years after performing such activities would they be admitted to the party. And uh, it is interesting to explore further, and maybe somebody now has an uh, answer to this question, whether and how this process was gendered. Uh, did it take uh, two, and two or three years for men also to become party members, or, or this is only uh, um, important when it came to women? Also, uh, even um, even though the one of the main party tasks uh, was to recruit as many members as possible, the described process uh, demonstrates the, that this was done with a certain level of caution, of course, because of the uh, political uh, repression communists were facing. And it is interesting that all communist women in their memoirs uh, mentioned the, the person who first introduced them to the uh, to communism, and also the person who granted their membership in the party. And as I mentioned, many of them were influenced by their immediate family members, in most cases brothers and lesser extent sisters. Uh, so for example, Sonia Baruch was inspired by her sister Rachela and her three brothers. Um, Vera Nenadvich also had three brothers who were active. So all, they, uh, all them had some sort of an influence inside of the family. Also, there were cases when women would join workers' movement, um, workers' unions, and then the workers' movement afterwards. Uh, for example, Vasich Ratomir stated that she heard about the workers' movement while she lived in Chachak, and that she came to Belgrade to start working and to join the workers' movement, which is quite interesting. Um, one, one important thing is that uh, becoming communist and being uh, active in the movement actually uh, highly depended on individual efforts of uh, women who were eager to engage in revolutionary activity. For example, Epa Perovic uh, moved to Belgrade and um, her apartment was used as a base for the journal Udarnik, as she lived in the same building as Mitra Mitrovic, and she was arrested and sent back to Bosnia, but then uh, she was um, given another job, uh, job in Serbia in the village Pashtic, which she described as a village that is loyal to the regime and the monarchy, uh, so she wouldn't be able to perform her um, activities in that village among peasants. Uh, so she contacted the um, 
the Sally Maslasher to ask for advice whether to, uh, to pursue her activism further. And he told her, this is a quote, I doubt that you as a woman would be able to do anything. The village is conservative. I would suggest you keep looking for a job in the city. Nonetheless, Lepa went to that village and to other villages afterwards and really developed a fruitful activity among peasants uh, and stood out among them. Um, also, one of the greatest advantages of the research based on, uh, on memoirs is the possibility to discover how communist women self-developed, what was their perception of their own activism, and what trajectories they, they followed. And in my research, I tend to uh, focus uh, on their performances rather uh, than on their role within the party or party-related organizations, as role is something that is accorded to a person, while performance uh, simply emphasizes a agency of a person. And I also believe that this concept of agency is uh, extremely useful when, develop, uh, when researching communist women's activism as it highlights individual actions of women, which are uh, often obliterated in the historiography. And it is important because all these, um, all these tasks that they performed that uh, Anna already mentioned uh, could be deemed as peripheral. And uh, we, we see that through the development of the uh, workers' movement, uh, these, uh, these tasks were actually crucial at, at some points. And uh, it is interesting that uh, in their memoirs, communist women also seem to belittle their efforts and their activism. So, for example, Vojka de Mayo in her uh, memoirs notes the following. I have to stress that my task was purely technical, so I cannot give you any information on the work of the party on, in the political sense, because I, at that moment, was not a party member. I was a coder. When there were busts, I would get texts from comrades and turn them into codes, and I would also decode coded texts. However, I neither attended the meetings of party members nor knew, nor knew anything about the organization of the party. The nature of my job was purely technical. So stressing the fact that she was not included in the party members and that she was ignorant about the work of the party demonstrates that she perceived her role uh, as marginal and uh, unimportant. And she further explained this in her uh, autobiography and she asserted, as a sympathizer of the Communist Party, I carried a great pain within me. Not one of my comrades ever offered to provide me with any theoretical education or to connect me to the party life. So I had a feeling that comrades were only using me when they necessarily had to. And only my true dedication to the idea of communist struggle did not allow my vanity to overrule and lead me to reject the tasks I was given, which I would always, happy from the bottom of my heart that I was given a task at all, complete successfully. So this, this uh, section of her uh, autobiography explains the origins of her perception on the role she played. And uh, it demonstrates the, how the lack of the interest of party comrades toward her influenced her perception of her role. A similar position was present in uh, memoirs of the Dobrila Rosti, uh, Rostovchanin, who recalled, we fulfilled technical tasks, bringing materials, trade union proclamations, gathering the membership. But when something needed a political explanation, I was not able to do it. So both Voik and Ratomir can recall the tasks that they did through the prism of the role they thought they played. And this focus on the role rather, rather on the task itself uh, led them to believe that they were unimportant to this broader workers' movement. Um, however, as I already mentioned, my research demonstrates that uh, Without these uh, efforts of individual communist women, development of the workers' movement would uh, go much, much more slowly uh, and uh, I believe um, unsuccessfully uh, in the conditions of illegality. And this realization was also present in memoirs of uh, Yelena Popovic, who was, who was a professor, uh, who stated, I believe that in the conditions of illegal work in Belgrade, the search and organization of the apartments for the illegals represented a very important sector of party work. So we see that some women actually understood the scope of their activism. However, she was a professor. So uh, unlike Dobrila and unlike Vojka, who, uh, who simply did not have that uh, understanding of the party organization. 
And also, uh, as we already mentioned, uh, communist women performed range of activities, um, and uh, it appears that in the year in the early 1930s, actually there was a gendered div uh, division of tasks within the party, um, and that this changed in the late 1930s when uh, more and more women started having prominent roles within the party and uh, simply stood out as successful organizers and party members. And lastly, it is important and interesting to note that both communist women and men uh, relied on uh, these traditionally prescribed gender um, gender roles uh, in order to uh, perform their party tasks more successfully. So, for for example, women would gather in the forest and they would bring children, so they wouldn't be suspicious to the police, or they would organize poselo and bring embroidery materials uh, and have meetings in such way. So, this is another interesting aspect of communist women's history and uh, this is only a part of my research further uh, I research how communist women um, uh, how communist women treated other women comrades and what it meant to have a communist in the family and how generational shift in the second part of the 1930s 30s actually affected communist women's activism but this is it for now Thank you very much, Mina. And uh, we can now uh, move to questions uh, after these three extremely interesting uh, talks. Uh, if, oh, okay. Uh, Ivana, you go ahead. Thank you. Uh, well, to be honest, this was the panel that I was most uh, excited for, to start with a little bit self-critic. Uh, okay, so my question, uh, I have two questions and they're based in, uh, they're more like meta questions because, because they're based in uh, uh, the context of historiography and uh, the topics. And the first is, uh, uh, I, I would like to ask uh, Anna Rajkovic. Um, I enjoyed uh, your presentation uh, a lot. And uh, I'm interested to, uh, to ask you, uh, can we talk about this plasticity of women's uh, left movement and communist uh, and women in a communist uh, party of Yugoslavia and their activities? Can we, uh, because I have this, um, um, notion from historiography, and I'm talking not this uh, uh, historic historiography after the 90s and uh, all this historical revisionism, but also the historiography from the socialist uh, uh, period and uh, socialist national historiographies, that uh, when, we, when we talk about uh, activities of uh, communist women and uh, left activist uh, women, they are this kind of monolith. And uh, maybe that this comes from uh, the notion of, um, uh, how can I call it, ideological purity that was projected uh, to, the, to the communist cause, maybe I'm wrong. But today in public his history, we have the, this uh, monolithic uh, representation. Uh, I, I, uh, I am telling, um, uh, it's important for me because uh, the, if we go to, into local archives, we can see that there were uh, all this uh, cooperation between communist women with bourgeois feminism and even nationalist femi feminists. And they were, uh, this political strategy, strategy of the communist party um, uh, at all and uh, women communist in particular was uh, actually, uh, actually a very flexible political uh, strategy uh, and uh, at the end of the day, we cannot talk about uh, this kind of monolithic uh, um, idea of pure ideology uh, approaches in their activism and deeds. And uh, the second uh, uh, question I, I would like to ask um, uh, Minya Bujakovic about the ratio between this uh, extremely interesting and important memoirs in the archives and uh, uh, their uh, projection into uh, his historical biographies about these women uh, and how this creation of the, their political communist self is, is projected into uh, biographies. 
by historians uh, because I, I also see that uh, kind of uh, playing it safe and uh, 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 having an image about them uh, just like uh, the or a warrior, like a partisan warrior woman, a hero, uh, or uh, something that is uh, in that kind of uh, 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 pattern uh, of, of the communist party. Thank you. I guess uh, I'm the first and then, yeah. <laughs> okay, I would then, okay. Uh, well, I think you're uh, right, because we can talk about monolith communism, uh, women's organization. For example, we have Amitra Mitrovic. She was in Omodinska Sekcija, which was the part of the Shansky pocket. That was a bourgeois kind of, of organization. But I would also state that even though we can talk about the monolith organization of the movement, um, there was a slight, I would say, um, it wasn't a kind of hate, but it was kind of a misconception if we are talking about the relationship, relationship between the women on the left. Then we've got here so, uh, social uh, democrats, women uh, in the social de uh, democracy and women in communism. Uh, I would say that here is the big difference. Not all, uh, not ma not mainly uh, difference in the sense of bourgeois uh, uh, organization, but uh, communist uh, women didn't uh, want to get involved with, uh, let's say, Milica Topolovic. They were very, very, very eager to is establish breaking points. So, okay, we even we can consider to work with uh, I don't know Anastasia and so on, but we can work with Amilica Topalovic. So, uh, I would say about the monolism of of the communist women movement, it is and it it's not. It's something in the middle. Thank you. Is this okay? Yes, great. Thank you. Okay, uh, I will now answer. So uh, there is a huge difference actually when uh, when you compare these memoirs and biographies, uh, especially because in these old biographies, communist women and their activities are uh, valorized and uh, there is this sense of heroization of everything they did. So uh, because of that, I decided to use memoirs because they tell, uh, tell this different story, how it really looked on the ground and they focus on the pre-war period, uh, unlike biographies where mostly this pre-war period was only tackled for, I, I don't know, in few pages but here you have whole description of what preceded and how they came to came to the war and how how they imagined their roles in the uh, in the war so i think it's quite different uh, and uh, the the whole discourse used in the biographies is absolutely uh, contradictory to the discourse used in the memoirs so yeah thank you Stefan, vidiš da je Ivan maše ruku. Da, ne vidim, hvala što si skrenuo pažnju, jer nema interviju, stavio sam na speaker, onda može Ivane... Ok, thank you very much for both of these presentations. So, the first question is for Minja. I mean, I presume that because I have been looking uh, for a similar kind of material uh, in the former Museum of the Revolution in Rijeka, they were also gathering these memoirs from the end of the 50s, beginning of the 60s of people who have been uh, involved in the, let's say, broadly the workers' movement, but basically the main, let's say, uh, interest of those who gathered this documentation was about the uh, national liberation struggle. Uh, but my question was, I mean, uh, how much do you think that uh, these memoirs are representative of uh, the situation in the interwar period? Because I somehow suspect probably some of these elements of the memory have been reframed according to the situation at the end of the 50s and in the beginning 
of the of the 60s um, and also the question would be how much you think that this belgrade case could be representative for the interwar yugoslavian uh, women uh, communist engagement and this leads me to to question for for anna and this is actually uh, i mean something which was triggered by the mention of giuseppina martinuzzi uh, which, I mean, she's a member of the Communist Party uh, at the end of her life, basically. She, uh, during her lifetime, she was involved in the socialist movement, um, social democratic movement, in uh, mainly in Trieste, even though she was born in Istria. But my question was, I mean, and to frame it in the Yugoslav context, I mean, how much are visible this kind of regional uh, pre uh, unification differences in? the uh, politicization of women between Croatia, Slavonia, Dalmatia, Macedonia, Slovenia, uh, and so on. And also, I mean, how much are visible differences between uh, some urban, more developed, uh, I don't know, uh, areas uh, in comparison with some rural areas? OK, so I can start. Uh, of course, you're right. And um, all the time while I do research uh, on the memoirs, uh, I have in mind that these are co-constructed narratives and that we cannot take them with such certainty as something that is simply true and that hasn't been influenced by the developments after the war, of course. So I, I have this in mind and also I, uh, I note this in my research. So it's quite important. I, I agree with you. And uh, when it comes to Belgrade and how representative it is, well, of course, I feel like uh, this is a gap in my research because I would love to get to the memoirs of women who were active in other centers. However, uh, among women that I research, there are many women from different parts of Yugoslavia. And this makes this research more coherent, even though I focus only on Belgrade. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Only, only one, 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 I would say, you know, a kind of a advice maybe, but again, the problem is time as always. You could just compare uh, these memoirs with some police files from the previous period and then to see maybe there are some differences between the things which are narrated in the 50s and 60s. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I also do that. So in the broad, yeah, thank you. Okay. Regarding polarization, uh, well, I think that this, this thing is most visible uh, in the name of organization because you have, after World War I, uh, Serbian women are having intense to, uh, to say that the name of the new women organization should be included Yugoslavian name, like we are one nation unification and so on. But you have some society in Croatia, such as Nasha Shazena, uh, which uh, stated that no, 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 in the name of the new organization, we should include Croats. So we are women from Croatia, and they are pre pretty uh, uh, open to it. So this, uh, they say, okay, we are Croatians, we are not Yugoslavian yet. And this is like after World War uh, One. So uh, women kind of here had a big difficulty in the in the sense of adjustment to new uh, new states. Uh, one of the uh, women who embraced Yugoslavian as ideas and the state was Zovka Kveder here in Croatia. But she was, uh, I would say, not the only one, but. Uh, uh, fewer just women were uh, together with her in this sense that we are uh, Yugoslavian women. We are not the uh, the Croatian women or uh, I don't know, Serbian women, Slovenian women and so on. So the polarization was uh, all this interwar period uh, mostly known in this national question, which was very important as you all know in, in this period. And so this is reflected to, uh, to also uh, women organization. Uh, when we are talked about the village, city, and rural and urban uh, area uh, in Croatia, as I have almost uh, uh, do research here, uh, it is uh, most known in the uh, Mara Matoc case, uh, 
uh, where she was mainly represent this uh, uh, village women, women from rural uh, area. And she stated that uh, uh, women from village, they, uh, they need a new organization because uh, women from city, they do not, uh, uh, they, uh, they didn't familiar with the problems of the women in village. And she's kind of uh, said that uh, uh, women in village has uh, more children, while women in town have a one or none. So she stated kind of this is a big difference. And because of it, uh, women from city can understand the problem, women from villages of rural area. Yeah, thank you. I was more thinking about, let's say, something which is uh, connected with the fact that uh, pre-existing uh, social democratic organizations had, I would say, differences between the just, let's say, the Austrian and the Hungarian half of the monarchy, that this also could play a kind of a role in politicization of women, which could be different, let's say, between uh, what is the present-day territories of Slovenia and the present-day territories of uh, Croatia and Slavonia, so maybe this also could have had an influence in the, uh, let's say, politicization in the sense of uh, a kind of national perception of, uh, of self. But uh, um, I was more interested, let's say, in this kind of differences probably between uh, the uh, social extraction of women in different areas. I mean, if there are, uh, I would say, uh, visible differences in the social extraction between these different areas or there are not so many differences? This was more, more the question, I would say. Uh -huh. so let's say, I was thinking in the sense, sorry, uh, in the sense, I mean, in Rijeka, which is not part of Yugoslavia, but we have tobacco, tobacco factory workers, which then, I mean, obviously have been politicized uh, before. Yeah, well, I, uh... in my research, I, I, I kind of, uh, when we talked about this pre, or social democratic organization and so on, uh, women were not so involved. I do research in Zagreb in, in Osijek. Uh, they were, okay, they were uh, in, involved in unions, but not in the party. So after the World War I, most of these women, Mari Yasuki, Adela Pavošević, they all um, uh, became the members of Communist Party. They didn't become the members of the Social Democratic Party, SPU, right? So I think that the, uh, when we are talking about the women and this ideological frame of, of Communist and Social Democratic, I believe they were more, uh, more familiar with the problems that they were um, uh, dealt with in, in, the, in the gender issues. Uh, if I might add, yeah, also in terms of what uh, Ivan was getting at, you mentioned uh, Zofka Kveder, for instance, uh, obviously she is pro yugoslav one because the Slovenian yeah. democracy is more uh, oriented towards Yugoslavism, plus on top of that, her husband is Croatian, right, and she lives in the yeah. So, I, I, yeah, I think these things do definitely kind of matter, and and of course she also does not side with the communists because most of the Slovene Social Democratic Party eventually ends up siding with the reformists. So there's some legacy there, as well. Um, and are there some more questions? Uh, if I may, uh, I would like to ask something as well. Uh, I have sort of a, a question for all then a brief comment for all the panelists and then one question in particular just for uh, Ivan. So first of all, thank you everyone for the extremely interesting panel once again. I really enjoyed it. And uh, the overarching question I have for all of you is uh, really about the, uh, uh, the political thought and intellectual production of uh, communist women. And, uh, Anna touched upon it a little, you know, mentioning that article from Radnička Straža, and uh, Anna is probably the one who knows why I'm asking, because I'm also working on this series, Classics of Yugoslav Communism, where I'm, I want to republish some of the theoretical works of uh, Yugoslav communists, and it's been extremely difficult uh, to find, uh, you know, probably it's there in the 20s in the newspapers, but it has never been republished in Yugoslavia or afterwards, the political thought, the feminist thought of Yugoslav. Uh, communist women. Uh, so I would like to uh, 
ask all three of you to kind of reflect on that and maybe on the reception, but also to say if you have encountered such theoretical works like the one that uh, Anna mentioned on the uh, motherhood and the emancipation of women. Uh, the second one, which I said is uh, more of a comment, uh, concerns uh, what I think is this uh, standard narrative and even also mentioned briefly that you know you have the emancipation of the 1920s, uh, then you have a kind of re-traditionalization that follows the trends in the Soviet Union, and then there isn't really a feminist movement in, until the 1960s in Yugoslavia. Uh, but I would like to bring the attention to this uh, very interesting group at the University of Belgrade in the 1930s. Uh, they are, uh, they're labeled as Trotskyists, obviously, because it's 1930s, uh, but they are essentially followers of... Uh, the ideas of uh, Alexandra Kolontai and of Wilhelm Reich at the University of Belgrade. And uh, they, were, they were quite numerous, apparently. They did cause the headaches for Skoy and the party. Um, so uh, they're kind of you know, shunned by the communist students, but they're very popular because they're talking about these ideas of free love and sexual emancipation. Uh, and they are led by the Paternoster siblings, uh, a family from uh, Banja Luka of Slovene origin. Uh, interestingly, they only uh, attracted attention of the Serbian far right in the, re in the last 20 years or so because uh, they served to build this narrative of, you know, immoral, sexually depraved communists, which you can't really build when you look at these <laughs> strict solids, uh, but you can, you know, try and make a connection uh, of these people. And they have very interesting uh, life paths. Uh, you know, this group is clearly under research, so what I'm telling you is very superficial, but you have the three siblings, you have Neda Paternoster, uh, and she's the only one who actually survives through the war, and she's kind of helping the partisans in the 40s. It would be interesting to see if there's anything that she left after the war. And then there's her brothers, uh, Mladen Paternoster, who was kind of the unofficial leader of these so-called Trotskyists, uh, and he dies in 1937, falling out of a train, and there's still speculation of whether this was a murder or suicide and so on. And then uh, uh, their brother, Ratko, who being a part of this circle eventually ends up becoming a collaborator of Eustache and he's lured out of Banja Luka in 42 and murdered by the partisans. So it's like a completely crazy family and God knows what else might be there. So I, I would kind of like to put it out there. Maybe somebody will uh, be interested and be able to dig something up uh, on them. And finally, my question specifically for uh, Ivan, uh, I would like to ask you to elaborate on what you mean when you say that the communist parties were uh, Stalinized. I mean, it's kind of you know present throughout the uh, article with the Moscow influences and changes in policies and so on. But I would like to kind of hear more of your reflection on it because it's also something I'm dealing with in my work now. What are the processes of Stalinization in constituent communist parties? So there you go. Am I going first or? Feel free to, yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, God knows that I have looked for some intellectual text written by communist women. Didn't find nothing. I looked in the archive in Zagreb, in Osijek, and uh, in Split. I didn't find. Um, it doesn't mean that there is no any, of course. Uh, but what I have found and, we, and what is also very interesting are the articles in the newspaper that you mentioned, Stefan, I think also written by, uh, by women. So you have uh, got a numbers of uh, um, articles in Radnička Štampa, Radnička Riječ, Organizovani Radnik, uh, but um, when, you have, when you see the signature, there is no name, there is no even initials, only is written female worker. So we don't know who are these women, except they the were workers, okay? But uh, there is no name. The, uh, under some texts, I found uh, uh, one text with the initials, ML. I didn't, I didn't succeed to find <laughs> who, uh, who was that, but I think it's, um, although there is no text in, in intellectual, um, sense that was written by the women, but these articles are, are a very good source for analyzing women's position in society, but also I have found uh, three or four texts in which uh, female workers, uh, which are the name, uh, who are the members of independent worker, uh, are, are writing about how men 
are treating them. So they say, okay, we are comrades, but they are still very um, bad to us. They are calling us names and then we have got four and something like that, which I think it is very in interesting in a sense to explore which uh, or how were uh, the relations between male and female in labor movement, which is also a, a very, very important question. So for now, uh, regarding uh, women's writing, I think that uh, we are um, doomed to, to, to this article in the newspaper for now. Um, uh, yeah, if I might notice, at least from my uh, kind of limited experience with the communist press, obviously illegality was the reason why they couldn't write these. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes in 1919 and 1920, of course, they're still kind of cautious, but more, yeah. uh, more likely in 1920 to find actual names. That's kind of virtually uh, impossible. So yeah, that kind of makes it difficult. And it would be yeah. interesting to try and identify at least some of these authors. Um, I know that uh, there was a uh, Greta Diamant in uh, Vukovar, uh, you know, she definitely, uh, I read some article and I tried to find it now on Twitter, but I haven't been able to, but she was kind of, I know. <laughs> she was a subject of attacks, which are very clearly both uh, sexist and playing with this idea of like the sexually moral communist, but also attacked on an anti-Semitic basis. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. I'm sure I mentioned her. Uh, and the one thing you might find interesting in the Ochak's uh, biography of the Tzvich brothers, uh, there is talk of, uh, uh, in, uh, it's also a uh, clearly a memoir that uh, Ochak is uh, writing this uh, from, but it's about how uh, you, uh, some use of communist women, I think it was, uh, it was Vladica Debeljak, I think, raising these issues precisely of like, how the male comrades are treating them and so yeah. on. And then the male comrades are ridiculing this. And the Tzvich, you know, being one of the more educated Bolsheviks, actually uh, sides with the women. And obviously that moment is also important, you know, like the male authority says that, yes, it's okay to discuss the women's question. <laughs> but but uh, it would be maybe interesting also to find that memoir for probably not just you, but the other panelists as well. Yeah, thank you, Stefan. So regarding names, um... I actually gave the entire uh, uh, collection of Proletar from the interwar period to my team to try to decipher all the names. And basically, so far, we only got two women. And uh, one of the art, and they're just one of two articles, you know, there is like not many. Uh, one of them is Yelena Nikolic, and it was something about uh, May Day and working women, that was 1932, and so on. So there was really not that many. And also some articles uh, uh, were not signed and we suspect that they might be written by women because they are on the same team and the same topic as some articles that are signed. So that is kind of, uh, we are trying to, to, to make some uh, deduction from that. Um, and actually that also relates to what you said about this uh, great retreat and uh, this entire group at the Belgrade University because in 1937, Rodolf Cholakovic had to publish an article in Proletter exactly, criticizing uh, this entire free love thing. And uh, the article is actually written, it's called uh, For Proletarian Sexual Ethic. And that is the only time uh, during the entire existence of Proletter that sex was mentioned. And uh, actually Cholakovic was uh, um, very critical of what was happening among uh, some particular you. They were never really uh, mentioned by name. And that was written in 19 1937. And it was really a nice example of, um, um, you can see clear influences from Soviet newspapers and uh, the phrasing that was used and explanations that were used. It was pretty much a, something that would be written in Pravda as well. Um, and that also brings me to what you said about uh, this great retreat idea. Uh, I just have to say that um, more recently, uh, well, not really more recently, like in the last decade or so, in the Soviet historiography, we no longer um, really accept this entire paradigm of the great retreat, particularly when it comes to gender relations. Uh, a lot of that is written by, for example, Elizabeth Wood, uh, David Hoffman, uh, Ted Healy. Um, I mean, we acknowledge, uh, 
Stalinist gender policies that were happening, for example, with the criminalization of abortion, uh, with uh, criminalization of homosexuality, of male homosexuality, uh, with promotion of motherhood, and so on. But we also acknowledge other things related to Stalinism, such as that more women than ever were employed, more women than ever became scientists, at their uh, highest possible degrees, and so on. And then we also return to the 1920s and actually show that not even many in the top Bolshevik leadership, including Lenin himself, were really interested in gender-related issues in the 1920s. And then the entire idea is that instead of this sharp break that we were thinking that existed between, uh, you know, this uh, so-called liberal and free 1920s and the 1930s, was more like uh, more like uh, an evolution rather than some kind of sharp break. Um, and that we have to acknowledge nuances of both 1930s and 1920s, there were social changes. What I'm not sure, and that I cannot really prove, is that either Yugoslav or Bulgarian communists were aware of these changes. Uh, I was, I mean, uh, you can see some of the changes, for example, when you go year by year of the curriculum that is in international Latin school, but that were also changes about big political issues such as industrialization, collectivization, removing some authors like uh, Trotsky or Bukharin and removing everyone else who was purged and so on, but not really um, in, these kind of, in these kind of issues. So honestly, I'm not really sure that uh, uh, Yugoslav or Bulgarian communists were aware of you know, big changes that were, uh, or the big differences from 1920s and the 1930s. Although I have to say that the first Yugoslav abortion law from 1951, which was in the penal code, was literal translation of the Stalin's uh, 1936 abortion law, which just won two small stipulations that changed the entire nature of the law. And that is that women were not punished and that there were social conditions for abortion. So just one, the entire text is completely the same translation for Russian, which just, just two small sentences which then change the, the nature of the law. And that is also one thing of uh, um, how the party was Stalinized and how all these people were learned um, to, and that, that actually comes to your third question, how they learn to uh, uh, see and speak one particular version of Bolshevik. Um, and that is actually done through, um, criticism, self-criticism, socialist competition, uh, towards their attitude, towards opposition, and uh, towards other party members, and so on. But I also think that in this entire process, um, uh, language is really crucial. Um, being uh, um, in the Soviet Union was super dangerous as well, as it was being in uh, interwar Yugoslavia or interwar Bulgaria, and learning how to navigate that language and how to navigate what is the proper party line was super important. And uh, um, many people actually wrote about this um, on how international revolutionaries were Stalinized, like for example, Tsola Tragojceva, Dolores Ibaruri, um, many people from uh, Eastern Germany, uh, well, later Eastern Germany, uh, uh, the same, you know, German Communist Party and other Eastern European countries, uh, Czechoslovak uh, communists and so on, how they were Stalinized through this entire process. And then I'm pretty much relying on, for example, what Studer was writing, or what Kirchenbaum was writing, and uh, actually people who were uh, in-depth researching how, for example, International Lenin School worked, how hotel looks worked, what it meant to sit down there in the lobby and drink coffee, and talk about political issues. That was also uh, one very specific way of becoming Stalinized. Or for example, what it meant for Sana Babovic to go to uh, somewhere in Caucasus and to be on the collective farm and then in some factories for a few months. That was part of her formal training. And that was, the, that was part of the entire process that was happening. And I also argue that um, once these people, and now I'm particularly focusing on Tsola uh, Dragojeva and other Bulgarian communists, but also it relates to Yugoslav as well, once they return to the country and then how they organize a society and how they, um, how dogmatically they went through some issues, that that was actually that part of the Stalinization process. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, um, I'll just slightly elaborate because I'm also what I'm kind of struggling with is that 
you know, you have Stalinization as a process in the Soviet Union, but then you have it as a separate process uh, within the Comintern. And, and in both cases, yeah, I think you can say that you're talking about an evolution rather than a sort of a sharp break and certain practices, uh, uh, certain prax practices are continuities with the time of Lenin, others are kind of radical changes. And then uh, the question is, you know, can we call uh, can we call constituent parties Stalinist in the period of the 1930s before they're not even in power? And you know what are the implications of that? If uh, you know, the most Stalinist party of all, by most accounts, which is the US party, becomes the one that makes the most radical break with Stalinism and so on. I mean, I'm you know I'm not kind of offering any <laughs> any answer, answers here, just kind of more questions because I think it's a very interesting topic and something that I'm also hoping to be researching further. Uh, just to add that uh, maybe there is not a definite answer that while yeah. looking uh, at the process of Stalinization, we are just looking at a, a framework to explain certain processes that are happening in the party, um, which might not be the definite answer, right? Any other questions? Yeah, I would just like to add that you can find, as Anna mentioned, traces of communist women's thoughts in journals, especially in Jens Hippocrat, which is uh, somewhat unexpected, but still you have, uh, you have this hybrid uh, discourse within this journal, and you can find uh, many articles written by Desen Katvetkovic, for example, in Jens Hippocrat. Uh, so that might be useful for you. And, and the thing with Jenski Pocket, I was I was going through it, but the, the problem is that they're kind of quite cautious, right? Because it's yeah. speaking a mainstream uh, a journal, and they don't want to get banned for communist propaganda. So even people like Cvet, uh, like Cvetkovic are quite cautious, and uh, Draga Stefanovic is also writing. She's trying not to make it too political, and she's writing. Obviously. It's easier later in the 1930s when, with the Popular Front, the rhetoric itself uh, coming from the Communist Party is much more. But I kind of feel that, you know, even if they can talk about some things, even if, uh, you know, Tvetkovic writes about Rosa Luxemburg or if Stefanovic writes about, uh, I don't know, the position of uh, orphan children, I think is one of her articles, uh, mm -hmm. they're very wary when it comes to drawing kind of clear and explicit. Uh, uh, communist conclusions and communist solutions to the issues that they are describing. So th yeah, that's- yeah, yeah, definitely. But still it served as a platform mm -hmm. for expressing such ideas in that period. So it was still, it's yeah, still yeah. useful for research, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, if there are no further questions, I would like to- Thank everybody for an extremely interesting panel and interesting questions. Um, we'll see you tomorrow at 11 a.m. here for the third panel. Uh, just point out, uh, do you have a question, Vera? Well, I just wanted to say something before we sign off. Yeah. Uh, so I, yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, I just wanted to very briefly mention that we will have another YouTube link. Uh, so basically, tomorrow we will try to make it work that the YouTube link uh, stays uh, through, uh, throughout the three uh, panels rather than to change a uh, link every time we pop live stream. So I sent it to the chat and Luca has also sent it on YouTube. So whoever is interested, follow uh, the rest of the panels on that link tomorrow. Uh, that's all for me, so. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you, Stefan, for organizing this and also Dan for uh, helping uh, make it happen. And we had some big plans to have it live and even bring uh, maybe the statue of uh, the bust of Vladimir Chopic to us on the Rijeka somewhere and create a provocation. But unfortunately, that's going to have to wait until some other anniversary. And I really enjoyed, all, especially this, this last... Uh, panel and the, the presentations and I'm teaching a course on revolutions right now. So I think uh, hopefully some of my students are also paying attention or they can watch on the recording because I think it's, it's great that the, this kind of research is going on and uh, 
again, congratulations to all the, the presenters. I thought that was really great. And of course, the first panel as well. Um, and it shows that, you know, that we can still keep um, you know, digging and finding these things in the, in the archives and uh, new interpretations and new visions of it. Uh, so I don't know, do we want to talk about Tragovi? Dan, did you want to say anything? Or maybe for tomorrow? I don't know, maybe just a, a word from our sponsor. No, well, well, thank you. But I mean, you know, my role really is, is rather uh, minimal in a way. I mean, we, we just, I just uh, thought that, for example, since we, we've started this journal for Serbian and Croatian studies, Tragovi, which has been published by the Archive of Serbs in Croatia, that is the Serb National Council behind it as an organization, that we should somehow um, just support it as much as we can. And obviously we are very much interested in getting some papers out of this. If anyone is interested, you may obviously uh, contact me um, e either through Stefan and Vieran or directly. Um, I mean, my email is pretty simple. You know, it's this institutional one, dan.jovic at fbzg at hr. So that's basically it. I'm very happy. To, I mean, uh, you know, both in my personal capacity, I mean, being somebody who has been dealing with, with Yugoslav socialism for a while, um, I'm, I'm very much, I was very much keen to follow all this and, and we'll, we'll, we'll try to come tomorrow, although not for the whole day. But um, so I'm, I'm quite glad that it's, it's been organized, although not in a personal um, you know, gathering, but rather online. But, you know, that's, that's life these days. Thank you so much. I mean, for organizing it, for joining, and for great papers. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. What's the deadline for the papers that you're looking for, Dayan? Okay, we have uh, our first next issue is now about to be published in May, but we publish in November and in May each year. So we have two issues per year. Um, and this, we'll publish something by Stefan. Um, so you will you'll be able to see it, I think, in, in about 10 days um, online. Um, but then, you know, we obviously, re we accept papers as they come. And uh, so it's November issue or May next year. But if there is Thank more, you. more than one, maybe we could do a small block or something like that, especially issue or something. I mean, it depends really of how, how big is the interest for that. Well, I think about the, you know, this panel had, um, you know, a lot of, common points, so that would be a, a great one, but I, I don't know what the uh, the authors, the presenters, if they're already planning on publishing elsewhere or busy with other things, but I think that'd be great. Sure, and there were some other ideas that came to my mind. For example, Milan Ogrizovic was mentioned. I mean, that's, that's, for example, somebody who we would be very much interested in taking the specific focus of the, of, of the journal into wider area of Serbian and Croatian studies, that is. So, it's rather wide and deliberately so, but for example, some of these topics would interest me very much. So I think that's more or less it for today, right? Uh, yeah, I, I will see, of course, I think we can also discuss it tomorrow at the end of the conference for a little bit, or even continue the discussion regarding publication by email afterwards. Uh, but for now, I would once again like to thank everybody and uh, remind you to save uh, this link if you, again, if you have some. On the same Zoom link uh, tomorrow at 11 a.m. for the third panel. Thanks again. Yeah. Okay, bye, bye bye. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. 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 Ciao.